You're listening to the RE Social Podcast with your hosts, Andrew and Vince from OnV Invest. For more information, go to onvinvest.com. What's up, you guys? Welcome to another episode of RE Social Podcast. And today we have Damien. Uh, Damien, for uh, viewers who don't know who you are, can you give a little 90 second intro about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. So I think a lot of people have probably bumped into me over the the last few years, a lot of podcasts. I've started a lot of companies, about 70 plus companies over the last 25 years, started real estate investing in the late 90s, Uh, basically bought my first house on a credit card, built up a pretty significant portfolio of 150 houses in seven different states. And then in 2008, took a $20 uh, $20 million uh, life and turned it into a negative $5 million life. So swung $25 million in about 12 months and it had to restart. I ended up going through a process of reimagining, reinventing, wrote a book called Reinvented Life. And, and then over the next 10 or so years, really started thinking differently about money and business and, and started changing how I was launching things with more purpose. And it wasn't just about money, it was about the impact. And that, that's what led me to the place where I started focusing on people's retirement after seeing my folks both retire broke and then die broke, uh, at least on my dad's side, it, it hit me pretty hard. And I, I thought there's got to be a better way. So I put all my efforts the last six, seven years into helping people with their retirement space and, and, and getting involved in projects that I could share that were really meaningful and would create great returns for all of the different stakeholders, including our current project. Wow, that's a lot to unpack there, man. So uh, you said you, you went negative 5 million? What's that? Yeah, so I went from 20 million positive to negative 5 million in 12 months. So I basically had my world and I ended up going homeless. I was a, it was a really humbling experience and I think I needed it my, to get my ego in check and to really ask better questions like, why am I doing this? Why am I here? Not just, hey, let's go make some more money. Is that the, I'm going to guess is the 2008? Yeah, it was, it was, it was called the 2008 awakening. It was like, hey, you really aren't that smart. And I went, yeah, you're right. I'm not that smart. <laughs> Was it in stocks? Did you lose it, or was it in houses? No, no this was all. This was housing. I had. I was building apartment complexes, uh, remodeling them, building condo towers, remodeling multi-million dollar houses. I had a lot of things. I had too many things going that I was trying to run myself, and I didn't have the expertise to play at that high level. Nor did I have the team. And I learned about the fundamentals of like you have to have a team, and you got to have experience. And I mean, it's funny when there's when everything's going up, everybody thinks they know everything until things go sideways or down like a lot of people are experiencing now. And I just, I realized I needed to learn a lot more. Yeah, man, that's, that's very interesting. You know, Um, so tell me about that, um, you know, the learning experience from the 2008. So if, you know, if let's say we are going to have somewhat of a crash or COVID or shutdown or something, um, what can people do uh, or what did you do that you learned that you would not do it again? Like uh, we understand cash flow and all those things. So is it because you took, you were doing like a lot of flips in a way or builders and because you'd have to take a lot of risk up front and then the market changed? I think the list is long. I think you just nailed a few of them. I mean, one of the the primary things that I missed when when you when you start having success, it's a terrible, terrible teacher. And one of the things that we think is that, oh, I know things and we stop putting people that know way more than us around us. So in my my case, I stopped bringing people in that were that were way wiser and at the time way balder and way grayer than me. And so I was basically the smartest man in the room. And w- what I'm getting at is that you always want to have people that are way smarter than you that will tell you the truth. People that are way more successful, that are decades further down the road in life. And I just stopped doing that because I thought I knew everything. And and today that's more relevant than ever. Having people around you that have already gone down the path. I I see a lot of people that are trying to figure out how to deal with their messes right now in real estate. And they don't have people around them that have gone through it. I've been through, I think, damn near everything you can go through. And and then I I realize every week, wow, there's something new I haven't gone through. But I mean, lawsuits and bankruptcies and and all that stuff. And and it's it I learned a lot there. And unfortunately, I had to learn it by just going through all of it. I didn't learn it because people were around me that were helping me, helping guide me. One of the things that they, that person, that mentor, that mastermind that knew more than me would have said to me was, you need to narrow your focus. You are in too many different things, too many places. And that's, that's also a huge mistake, being scattered and not focused on the thing and thinking that it doesn't really matter that you don't have to be focused. Focus is where you make wealth, you create wealth, you create impact. And I was all over the place trying to scrape dollars out of different environments. And ultimately, they scraped me to death. Yeah, so a lot of um, jack of all trades kind of uh, situation. 
Um, the, the jack of all trades is a huge part of it. And it's just thinking that it's, it's okay to be everywhere. And, and, and a lot of people that are maybe passively investing, they think, oh, I can throw money into all these different things, whether it's oil or it's apartments or it's, you know, it's, it's the next thing. And, and we don't really know a lot about the things. My, my suggestion to everybody, whether you're building something, building a business, or whether you're investing, is to really dig deep into something and then go to the next thing. Don't This idea of diversification is one of those things that's great if you already have 20 or 50 or 100 million bucks, but to diversify when you're doing your first million is really, really stupid. Because you don't really get, you don't really know what you don't know, and and you don't realize how big of a gap there is, and how many mistakes you can make because you just have no idea. Yeah. So, and for the, um, you know, when you were losing some of the houses and stuff, so can you say uh, it is because you had loans and you had uh, uh, things that you had to pay out, but there was no income coming in because you're in the building phase, and when the market changed, the property values crashed, and the bank said we want to lend. Is that how you lost it? That's one of the ways I lost it. There was okay. there was debt that was that was irrationally expanded. Like you could call a bank and you could, and they would double your credit line on a credit card. And I used a lot of credit cards back then to just keep paying on interest payments for deals that were dead. One of the reasons that I think mentors are so valuable is they can say to you when you respect a mentor, they can tell you when your deal is dead and when you need to stop. And I wasn't willing to stop until I was out of money. <clears throat> So what I did instead was I kept borrowing, finding ways to borrow money on credit cards to feed things. And I had things that were negative that, you know, I, I had houses that I had a million dollars into or a million two into that ended up going to foreclosure and selling for 500,000 or 400,000. So I was just hoping, and it's, it's, I call it smoking a bunch of hopium. I had this idea that if I just kept going, it would all eventually work out. But there's a saying that the market can be irrational longer than you can be liquid. And that was never truer than 2008 when I just kept going. But it was a lot of the debt and it was not being, it was not acknowledging reality. And I think that that's one of the biggest things for everybody, no matter where you are, rich or you're super rich and down the road or brand new, it's acknowledging reality. Whatever is true is what you want to work with. It's not what you hope it to be. Forget about that. What, what is actually true? And then deal with reality. You can deal with anything. You can fix just about anything, but you can't change a lie. You can't fix a lie. Yeah, really, really good um, lessons for you. So how did you, um, after, you know, you're probably sitting in your self-pity party because you lost a lot of money. How did you get out of that, man? Because it will take, I mean, I don't know if I would have been able to come out of that. It, it's it's hard. I mean, that one one of the, the things that's a real, that, that sucks about going through that process is it really derails you from being able to be in the game. So after 2008, I spent several years where I was so scared of my shadow and and afraid to make a mistake because there was so much pain and trauma and blood and and mud in that whole process. I was out of the game when I really needed to be in the game. 2009, 10, 11 were when a ton of money was made because that's when everybody was freaked out and bleeding to death and dealing with the aftermath. So I spent those years recovering and really it was it was building up the confidence to go out into the and get in the game again. I, I and and how did I do that? I, I went and I asked for help. I got I got help from people that could ask better questions. I spent almost two years with one guy and he asked me for every week for almost two years, one question is, what is true? And we kept going deeper into the truth. And that became the basis for reinvented life when I wrote that book in 2012. It was asking the deeper question, what is true about me? What's deeper? What what matters to me? And and once I got clear on what actually mattered to me and it wasn't just the money, then I could actually go and do something. Because if it was just the money, then I was basically going to be a whore the rest of my life. And I think that that's unfortunately where a lot of people are. They're whoring themselves out to just the money and they don't really have a purpose beyond the money. They think they might. But if you ask them deeply, why does this matter? It's really about security because that's what money is for most people. It's security that they're not going to starve to death or they're not going to be homeless. And, and beyond that, it's most people are lost for purpose. And the purpose is the thing that really drives you to a meaning in your life that matters. Yeah. So what was it for you? So when, when I saw I, in 2013, I got a call on Thanksgiving and my dad called me and said, Hey, I um, hope you had a nice holiday. By the way, I, I have stage four. Um, and so anyways, talk to you soon. And I thought, holy crap, my dad's about to die. So I, I flew up to Alaska and, and sat down with him. And he made a comment to me that stuck with me and it drove everything for the next decade. He said, you know, there were so many things in my life that I wanted to do. And he died a few weeks later. And it was, it was that moment of understanding what regret is. 
And I thought, God, this is terrible. I bet there's, I bet most of the people in the world are going to end up dying with regret of the things they didn't do. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that people don't have resources and they're too scared. Instead of taking chances or taking risks or moving forward, they sit idle and just hope it'll all work out, waiting for the thing to happen that will make life perfect. And so I, I learned that, and what, what, what hit me was I need to help as many people as I can for as many days as I have get past that place so that at the end of their life, they're not asking, they're not saying, oh, that I wish I had done these things. They're saying, wow, that was amazing. So it's really a purpose of, of finding ways to break people out of the financial bondage, creating opportunities, creating education, and, and giving people reality checks on the truth so that they do have that life without regret. Because I think regret is the worst hell on earth, getting to the end where you actually go, dang it, I missed it. That was the only one shot I had and it's over. Well, okay, so you had that revelation when you, you know, final moments of your dad. So you took that to heart and then you came back and then what what did you end up doing? Did you want to go back to real estate or were you freaked out about, about real estate? Well, so it's interesting. I, was, I think I was still freaked out about it. So I started asking like, the, the question of where's the impact? What's what's the thing that's going to matter? Like, why am I here? I started... I, I made a mistake and I started doing too many things at once again. I was consulting, I was selling some precious metals, some gold and silver. I was helping people with retirement accounts and I was doing all this with really not a lot of traction. And then I said, one day I said, well, what's the one thing I can do that will have the most impact on other people and more people. And that was helping them with their retirement accounts. And so that's really where it started. I narrowed, I took my own advice that I'm giving you out now, which is narrow the focus. And so I started there and then built that and made an impact there and, and spread that, built a team. And then over the over the next six, seven years, it expanded. And that's where things started diversifying. And then the, the niche really pivoted away from the original thing of the tool. And it, it pivoted into this, how do we help people holistically get to the place where they've broken their financial shackles? And, the, and so the projects that I'm working on now, building manufacturing plants and helping people invest in that, and it, that solves big problems. And it, and it helps fulfill the mission where people actually have certainty and predictability about money so that they have the tools, they have the fuel to be able to go and live that life. And, and so ultimately, it's evolved. And it's, it went from niche to expansion back to niche. And that's, that's where we are today, really focused on something that's impacting potentially the entire country and the world because of the disruption we're, that's taking place from our project in the construction world. Yeah. Okay. So I, I want to get into that, but before that, so did you, by this point, what kind of timeline are we talking? Is it 28, 9, 10, 11, 12? What is this? Yeah. So, so this, so the, the pivot where I, I said, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm done licking my wounds. I'm going to, I'm going to start focusing. That was about 2015. And oh, wow. So the, you lost about uh, half a decade. I did. Okay. And that's, and, and that's one of the hard parts about not acknowledging reality and, and yeah. saying, well, I'm just going to pretend that nothing is wrong. I'll just, I'll just go along. And then you get beat up and then you end up spending years licking your wounds. Or maybe like you said, you never even get back into the game. And so that, yeah, it, it does take years. And that's the biggest part about not being willing to be in reality. You can potentially lose half a decade, a decade, multiple decades. Being in reality, man, you can move right through it really fast. Wow. Okay. So then you spent five, five years, you were just uh, working, but since you filed bankruptcy, you're not, you don't really owe the 5 million anymore. You're just back to zero, right? Yeah. So going through a whole period of, of, you know, basically blowing everything up financially and being yeah. liquid, you, you move there. I mean, there's, I think emotionally, there's still, you feel like a, there's a karmic debt, you mm -hmm. know, and when that happens, when, when things do blow up. Um, so it doesn't really matter whether things get written off or, or whether there's legal filings when you make mistakes and, and people have trusted you and, and, yeah. you know, banks have given you money. There is something, there's a residue from that that never really leaves. Yeah, that's true. So, so you, you, you took five years and then you, you figured out like some form of manufacturing, like manufacturing homes. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah. So, so the manufacturing thing actually showed up ab about three years ago. Uh, it, it showed up with my partner and I, and it, it was a friend that said, Hey, I've got this thing you need to look at. And we were so busy, which I think is very common. People are so busy. They missed the golden opportunity that's right in front of them. And so we, we ignored it for about six months. And then we finally looked at it and we thought, this is, this is very disruptive. This idea would, would build all the framing for houses and apartments inside of a manufacturing plant for, I mean, really any type of house, any type of apartment. And it would do it in a controlled environment and there's almost no waste. 
And so we're missing something. There's this, this, this can't be real. And so we, we dug into it and we, we moved, we went out, met the, all the people that were the innovators that had been in this industry for 50 years since the seventies. And we realized this was real, but they had this dream and the problem they had, it wasn't the lack of experience. They had all the experience in the world. They just didn't have the capital. And we said, wow, I bet there's a lot of people that would like to be a part of this. And so we brought, we brought all the people together, all the investors, and, and we launched this. So our, that first manufacturing facility that builds all the bones, if you will, for houses and, and apartments, I will go online later this year in 2024. So it's, 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 um, it's interesting because not only does it build the framing for a house, which normally takes about two to three months, it does it in two weeks. So if you brought your plans for a house to, to the company, we would take those plans and you would have a framed house, custom house, track house, doesn't matter, in about two weeks. And it does it, the whole manufacturing process uses the patent and technology to where we have virtually no waste. I mean, we might have one or 2% waste instead of 15 or 20%. And that, that changes everything because we're faster, we're more efficient. The inside of a manufacturing plant, everything is tighter. The controls are tighter. So you don't have, you don't have a very, the deviations. And so it gives you a better quality product. So faster, better quality, and potentially even better pricing. And even if it was the same dollars, if you can shave off 75% of the time for construction, you change the entire deal. Yeah. So, um, so give me, tell me, talk to me about it. What is it? What, uh, I'm an engineer by day, mechanical engineer. So you can give oh. me the uh, details. Like, so is it, is it still wood or is it yeah. just because you're controlling it in a plant is obviously going to be a much tighter way to build stuff. Then it's like building a car in a playground versus building it in a Ford factory. That's what you're talking about, right? Yeah, that's a lot of it. Exactly right. So and part of the technology is there's, there's something called a finger joiner where you, where you take two boards and you put them together. This happens on site where people are building things. We've got that inside of our plant. So basically, we have whatever size board we're talking about, a two foot board or six foot board or a 10 foot board. And it comes and it literally gets attached, glued through this finger joiner process to another board. So ultimately, what you have is you have all these boards coming in and they become one continuous board. And then we've got a saw that cuts each piece that we need to an exact specification. And then we put it all together. So instead of taking a 12 foot board and then you cut off two feet, throw away two feet. To, so you have a 10 foot wall. We literally don't have any of that waste. It's only really the corner cuts that we have a tiny amount of waste. So you have one continuous board, which means we can buy any type of board. We, we don't need a certain size because we make our own sizes and we have almost no waste. So that technology, and this is all patented. This is our patent was approved uh, last year in 2023. And so you have literally this massively efficient use of wood and, and you can buy any size wood that has never been done before. Wow. That is interesting. So give me some numbers. So let's say I'm building an ADU in my backyard. It's going to cost me 300 bucks a square foot in Southern California. What, what can you come in at? Is it like 295 or is it five bucks? Like, what is it? Well, so what the idea there is that you can change a lot of variables where the market doesn't necessarily want to save money as much as it wants predictability because predictability and timing cost a lot of money if you don't have them. So for you, if you say we want to build this thing and it's going to take us three months from our contractor to frame it up, we're going to say, great, we can do that in two weeks. And so you give us the plans and two weeks later, so you shave off maybe two to two and a half months. And you just, and, and what that does, not only does it save you time because of the cost of money, but then you can predict the day that you're going to have a framed house or apartment or whatever, you're going to predict that day. And then you can put all the plumbers, the electricians right behind it. Normally that creates massive amounts of delays because based on weather, based on a lot of things, you have no idea when that house is actually going to be framed. So that's where you're getting a ton of savings and the quality of what we're building is better than anything that's going to be on site because the controls inside of a manufacturing plant are so so much tighter than they would be in the, in the wild, if you will, on site. Yeah. So, um, and uh, so would you have to hire your contractors to come build up the house or regular people will know how to do it? Yeah, that's the, that's the great part. So you literally say, here's the plans. And two weeks later, you're going to have a house that's framed on your property. So you don't have to go and try to find like a lot of a lot of, a lot of builders are having a hard time. Contractors are having a hard time getting framers, getting people that want to go swing a hammer. So in California, it's not necessarily the same thing as Nebraska. Nebraska, nobody wants to be out when it's 20 below zero swinging a hammer. In California, when it's 75 degrees, I have no idea where you are, but it's it's not. I mean, a lot of the, the weather is a huge problem with building. And quite frankly, a lot of people don't want to go swing hammers anymore. It's just a hard, laborious task. So 
this, we do the entire process. It's, it's a vertically integrated framing system that has virtually no waste. So you don't, we take that out of the equation of building a house, which is usually the biggest problem in building a house is, is the framing. Yeah, that's nice. And so the cost you're saying is comparable about the same or slightly higher, slightly lower, or is it about the same? It's, it's all, our entire model is based on the same pricing. So because we have, so like, because the market's going to look at us and they're going to say, okay, why would I choose you over somebody else? They would choose us because they're paying the same price and they get to shave off weeks or months and they have predictability in terms of exactly when something's going to be delivered and the quality. So it, you don't necessarily need to be faster, better quality. And you need, there's, you don't need all three of these things with the speed, the quality, and um, and the price. You just need to have two. And so our two are are the quality and the speed. And our price is literally the same. We could, in fact, charge more as as somebody that's built a lot. I would prefer to charge more and pay for the predictability and the quality versus spending less or the same and and having less quality or less speed or less reliability in terms of timing. Well, that's really cool, man. And then so so how was how how will this differ from uh, I know that you know I, I don't know why it is but it's like people don't like manufactured home as much there is I, yep. I think it's kind of silly but whatever it is what it is in the industry so will yours be considered as a manufactured home because it's built in a factory no that, not really it's 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 basically it's just a piece it's you know yeah. if you have a, a window that's that's part of a manufactured if you will how there's a manufacturing process but the house is actually put together on site it's just that all the, these these components that you have because you're you're still going to bring in you're going to bring in your electric electrical stuff you're going to bring in roofing materials you're going to bring in windows and doors and everything else so this manufactured housing is typically a house, maybe it might be in two or three pieces or whatever, but it's going to come out and it's going to be like stuck together. And that's it. Like the whole thing that's, that's got a great place in the, in the market, the housing crisis, because it helps solve it. But we've got somewhere between four and 7 million million homes that are missing or units in America. That's a lot of housing. So no one project, no one thing is going to solve it. The, each of our plants makes about 3000 houses per year. So when you've got four to seven million missing houses, you can have all of these plants in the world. You can have all the competitors. We need all of them. So it's, I think that's one of the questions that comes up. Well, what about the other ones? Is that a competitor? The answer is no, it's part of the solution. We need all that stuff. And, and different people want different things. Some people want, they, they want a custom house. Like you could say, I want a 10,000 square foot house. And that's what we could build. If you go to a manufactured, manufactured housing company, they're going to give you five models and you can tweak some of them, but you basically have one of five models or, or a certain number. You, we can build anything, apartments, houses, because it's all based on the framing. We build all the framing. We, that's our niche. So it's very narrow and we do it really well. And then you, you guys uh, leave the site after the framing is done. Then you just, uh, we just do whatever we want to do, right? Have you thought about investing in real estate and taking advantage of all of those benefits without any of the work? That is something that On the Invest not only provides, but has been providing since its inception. With friends and family, we have built an empire in a system of a wealth generating tool that is giving us and our friends and family that leverage in their life to create true wealth. Go to ontheinvest.com for more to see if you qualify. And thanks for listening. And then you you guys uh, leave the site after the framing is done, then you just, uh, we just do whatever we want to do, right? Yeah, so the, the actual framing, so we do, do everything in the, in the we, we convert the plans that you give us into our, our CAD system, and then we build everything. When we go out on site for the average 2,000 square foot home, it takes us about two days to do all the stuff on site. So we're going to tell you, here's your window. These two days, we're going to be out there and you can plan everything around that. And then we're gone. It's very, very streamlined. It's very efficient. It's very predictable. Wow, that's awesome, man. And what is the company called? Frame Tech. So Frame Tech. It's, it's, it yeah, it's a framing technology company, no H. So Frame T-E-C. And you can find out about it at frametech.com. And so nice, it's, it's really, that's it's a technology company. It's, we call it a Contech, construction technology uh, company. And what's interesting is, We've had a number of national builders, public companies that have come in and said, can we be your customer? Like they want all of the product. And we said, well, that would look like you buying us. And, and so we have, that's already happening because the construction industry sees the problem and it's not getting better. It's getting worse. 
and they're seeing us as part of that solution. So there's there's a natural appetite for that across the country. We've had people in Australia and other countries already asking if there's an opportunity for them to license this because they see how big of a deal it is. Nothing really changes in construction. The last innovation was like the electric nail gun. Like, you know, like it's just, there's not much that changes. This is a huge, uh, this is a big dis- disruption in the construction industry. Nice, man. Uh, and how many homes uh, can you think you can support? Do you have a factory somewhere? Yeah, they, each of the factories, so what, what, the way we've built it, our first factory will do about 3,000 units, which is a 2,000 square foot home or the equivalent apartments. Per also- year or? Per year, yeah, okay. so 3,000. And then our second plant, which is under construction, about, 150 miles from the first plant will do double because we've literally doubled the plant, meaning we have two of the same plants next door to each other. And that's how these are going to be built. So it's really like a franchise. It's the same thing being built over and over. So in a place like Texas, which we anticipate going to next, we would have 10 to 15 of these plants all in one space. And that would cover about 22 million people in Texas. So there's there's the ability to to go about 200 miles from our location and be efficient about it because we can deliver and then bring our trucks back the same day. And and so that's that's how this model works. It's very, very streamlined so that we can scale it. That's awesome, dude. Um, I don't know. Do you know who Jason Hartman is? I do. I do. Okay. In fact, I've talked to Jason, yeah. Oh, okay. So you have been on a show? Mm-hmm. I have. Oh, okay. Sounds good. I was going to introduce you to him. So because he he looks into different things because he always says there's, there's no technology in building homes. It'll be cool if somebody, you know, printed homes or something, but uh, that's cool. So you've already been on there. Well, it's, it's, uh, so it's, it's interesting because like there's this 3d space and I haven't talked to Jason since we launched this. So that's, it'll be news to him probably that this is happening. Uh, the, the 3d space is I, I think there's a huge opportunity there and, and that that's the cool thing. There's a lot of people trying to solve this problem. And the problem is so big that all these different solutions are going to have a different part of, of the, the, the overall solution. And so I, it's very fun to be in a space like that because I don't see anybody that's in this space as a competitor. I look at them as comrades or, or, you know, they're like, we're all in this thing, solving the problem together. And there's, there's so much problem that no one person or no one company is going to solve the whole thing. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. It's, uh, Real estate, that's what I see most of the time, I'm, especially investors. It's a, it's a very like a team kind of thing. Nobody really, like, I'm not going to hide that I'm buying outside Nashville. I'll be like, yeah, I'm buy. I don't care. <laughs> like this, you know. That, like, you, that, you, that, that was one of the things that really got us excited about this project. We looked at it and we said, okay, um, are there winners and losers? Like, how does this work? And when we dug into it, it was very cool to to realize that Everybody won. All the stakeholders won. And that includes the environment. This project is, is going to be certified Leeds Gold. It's almost entirely solar-based. We have almost no electricity pulled from the grid. I, the stakeholders, the employees, the teams that are there, the way that we treat people, the culture, the investors are doing incredibly well. Like Everybody wins. And that's for me, that's the only thing that I'm interested in after the meltdown and my focus being money when I was in my 20s. I'm not interested in doing anything and either with my partner that doesn't result in everybody winning. If there's a loser, we're out. There is, we don't believe in, in win lose. We believe in fair opportunities and, and, and things that, that impact everybody in a positive way. And that's what this is. Frame tech is all about everybody winning together. And I think that there's, there's a model there that like, we're not afraid of sharing this with everybody, even people that are building. It's like, here's what we're doing. And, and maybe they get an idea that helps them be better and helps solve more problems. I think building society, building America is about sharing. It's about building. And, and that's very cooperative. It's not really competitive. Yeah, I like that. I like that cooperativeness. So let's talk some numbers. I'm an engineer. So um, um, I don't know how much you can share, but is this company, so I'm assuming you're raising capital from investors. To get equity in the company and you you probably have a start date where you can start making money. Can you give us any information or no? Yeah. So so the first the first plant uh, and each of the plants will be about be similar. They take about two years from the time that we start to the time they come online. So our first plant's coming online this fall. Uh, we've got our the plant is built, the machinery is being installed right now, and it'll take about six months for all of it to be installed. So it's about a two year process. And then it takes the first year it becomes it's projected to become cash flow positive. So investors are likely to receive their their returns that first year it's in operation. Um, it's, you know, there's there's a huge opportunity, f- whenever you build something, and, and I, you probably know this, I assume when, 
when you're building like an apartment, it's a different model than going and buying an apartment. When you build it, there's typically a lot bigger return because you're building from scratch and it's a heck of a lot harder. So you can imagine when you're building a manufacturing company, and the example I give for for people that are thinking about investing in a space like manufacturing, imagine back in the gold rush in the 1800s in California, you had all the gold painters and they were chasing the speculation of the gold. And then you had a company like Levi's and Levi's was out there selling Levi's to everybody. And so we, we, we're more akin to the Levi's. We're, we're selling this product and creating the solution for all the different builders. And it doesn't matter whether we're in a recession or a depression or whether houses are in favor or apartments are in favor because we, we're dynamic. Everybody needs Levi's no matter what the economy is. Everybody needs framing no matter what the economy is. And so that's, that's a question. Do I want to invest in something that's literally recession-proof that can move through any interest rate environment, doesn't matter what it is. And I think that that's a really valuable thing. I didn't even think about this 20 years ago, but I think about it every day now. Wow. Okay. So how much does it cost to build a plant like that? Like, is it, are we talking like hundreds of millions or? So our, our plant is, is incredibly automated. There's, there's robots and, and it's about $60 million to build a plant. So our, our second plant is double that because it's literally twice as big. Uh, the one in the, when we do a 10, you know, that'll be six to eight hundred million dollars for that one. So the the one that we're we're raising money for now that, that we're sharing with the world that we can because of our, our SEC regulations is is about one hundred and thirty million dollars for the project. And that one does have opportunities for people to look at it. You'll see that stuff on frametech.com so people can dig into it. So these these plants there, it's it's a big it's a big number. It's not it's not like building a house. It's building something big. And what's really fun is that you can come and you can see it. You can put your hands on it. If you, if you come out to Arizona, by the way, the springtime is a really good time to come see this because it's the weather's amazing. You can come and you can actually be under the roof. It's two and a half acres. It's 111,000 feet under a roof and you can see it. You can walk through it. You can actually understand what investing in something that's being built is. You can talk to the people that are running it. I think that's one of the things that I learned. If I'm investing, I want to go touch the thing. I want to go talk to the people. And most of the time, if you invest in a stock, that's never going to happen. If you invest in, in real estate or a manufacturing company, that's an opportunity for you to start getting smarter and building confidence because you're a part of the deal. And what kind of IRRs or returns are you guys expected to... Um, um... How, how are you guys splitting up the equity? Is it like a 60-40 GPLP split? or? Yeah, so the, the investors uh, are, are projected to make in the 30s internal rates of return over a period of about five years. We expect between the cash flow and the ultimate sale of the, of the plant, it's somewhere in the, in the low 30s IRRs. And so that's, and then it's split up based on, uh, there's, there's an ownership. Ultimately, the investors have 30% of, of the manufacturing facility. And so the, the returns are somewhere between 30 and 35 that we project. Each the year, seventy percent uh, of the the equity is split among the general partners, partners, operators. There's there's a lot. One of the things that is different about a, building something is you've got a lot of people that are part of it that are that, that bring it to life. Uh, in, a, in a typical syndication for say an apartment where maybe you're buying something, you might have a general partner that that says, okay, we're going to have twenty percent of this, and the investors get eighty. That would you'd never actually build anything if that was the model because you have so many more parties that have to be a part of something to build it. There's got to be, and and typically you're just going to see something different. Uh, the other interesting thing is a return of thirty plus percent a year internally uh, compounded. You wonder, well, how's that possible? It's because the value proposition is so big. These plants are worth somewhere between five and six hundred and fifty million dollars when they're completed and online. And, and that's why the returns are so great because there's so much value created. You really aren't going to ever get anything like that kind of multiple going from 60 million to 600 million. This is like a 10x value proposition. The reason that happens is, is you're building. That would never happen if you bought an apartment and, and painted and put new doors on. That's a lot easier and there's a lot less risk. This is a lot riskier if you don't have people that know what they're doing because there's so much that you have to do over a period of years and the supply chains and everything else. So the value creation is is where all the juice is. That's that's what's unusual. It's hard to find things where there's value creation without some crazy black box that you really can't understand. It's it's very unusual, which is why I like it so much. So for a, a sixty million all in for the plan that you guys are getting done on in the fall, you think it'll be worth five to ten times that when it's done? Yeah, absolutely. That's that's what the the public markets that's what it, it's valued at, and it's based on the, the EBITDA, how much your the net cash 
that comes out of this thing is, and that's that's what it'll be worth. Uh, if we were to take it public or sell it, that's that's what it would trade at when they're when they're online. So it's it's based on empirical data. That's just it's really easy to figure that out in the public markets. And so we absolutely expect it to be five hundred to six hundred million. So for, and it's, it only costs sixty million to get out of the door, like just to get the first house made. Yeah, sixty million is is what it'll take to to deliver product, and sixty million plus fifty years of experience. So it's yeah, no, no yeah, I get it, but I'm just trying <laughs> to hedge the. I'm, I'm yeah. going somewhere with these questions. Sure. <laughs> uh, so, um, so you you build something for sixty, it's worth six hundred. So you, uh, is it two two x three x EBITDA? It's usually in, in manufacturing construction based on what the current markets is somewhere between eight and ten. For that that scale, when you have oh something okay okay high. that makes sense okay so yeah. you're you're let's just say ten so you're saying that you you'll be making about sixty million in pure cash net cash not per, gross per year right it's it's per, net yeah. cash right per year yeah yeah okay that's pretty good man and then so your business plan is to sell it off to somebody else why wouldn't you keep it this seems like a lucrative business so it is and and the reason so our our the way that we built this, the way that we structured it was, and the proposal for investors was that we were going to build it and then sell it. I, it doesn't mean that people aren't going to want to keep it because I think a lot of people have already voiced that they're interested in keeping it, but you have to, I think it's important to follow through on your original intentions with the investors. And so it, it will, it will likely produce 30 plus, maybe even 40% or more cash flow, cash on cash per year when it goes online and it's at capacity. And so in all likelihood, we'll end up building more of these plants and then keeping some of them. But that'll be the, the initial intention going in versus changing it. Um, and we have, we have a lot of different ways for people to, to get out of the deal if they wanted to, if they wanted to cash out and we kept it longer than, than they were hoping for. So there's, there's a lot of opportunity for people to have incredible returns and, and have timeframes that really work with them. But the, the, the first couple, our, our plan is to, is to sell those. And, and I think likely we'll end up building more and just keeping those. And the investors that are in the first couple of deals, they're the ones that get to be a participant in the other ones um, before anybody else. And probably the only ones that will be able to be in. It's just, it gets more complicated when you have thousands and thousands of investors. And so we're being mindful of, of how we do this, how we efficiently do this at scale. And so I think the opportunity right now is, is for the people that are getting involved in these first two plants. Okay. Um, did you also buy any homes for yourself in the meantime, or this is your main thing that you've done since the, the, all the, uh, 2008 stuff? This, this is the main thing. Oh, this is your main stuff, right? Because yeah, this is, this is the main thing. In. Yeah. There's, I mean, I've, I've done other things that, that led up to this and I, and, and so it's, it's funny because this is going to look like an overnight success story and I'm going to laugh every day about that because there was so much brain damage to get to the point where we have this yeah. thing that seemed to happen overnight. But this is definitely the narrow focus. The main thing, it's the thing I live a half an hour from the plant and I moved out here two months ago on purpose to be close to this. So there's a lot of energy, a lot of resources, a lot of human capital that's tied into this on purpose because it's that it's worth our attention. Yeah, that sounds good. So, okay. So uh, tough question time. Are you ready? Yeah. Um, so from what I'm listening to, you definitely have more guts than most people. Like I would not, this is, this is, I don't know, people listening, this is very important to know. This yeah. is a big high risk, high reward situation. I only do anything that has some form of cash flow immediately. Yeah. Like, but uh, uh, like, you know, Damien mentioned, uh, the upside is pretty low, but I'm playing with other people's money. I'm very, I'm very conservative. With my money, I, I used to buy houses with credit cards too in the beginning but now i have my sister's retirement i'm like no i'm not doing that anymore right. i need to see some float there some spread now how are you hedging yourself because to me from the outside it looks very similar to what you did early on in your career which is super high risk very high reward this is also very similar because um you know if the project's not completed then you would lose i am going to guess you're raising 100 percent of the funds and not going to a bank is that what you're doing yeah the the for the first plant, that was that was the case. We raised all the equity. Okay. I raised about forty. You can't really lose on that one. Do you, sorry, you can't really lose on that one because it's just your okay. investors. You can just tell them to wait another six months. Yeah. So, th so there. I mean, there are risks, and there. Are, there. I mean, you can have what you're betting on is you're betting the t on the team. You're yeah. betting on the team to solve problems, and and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to pretend that there haven't been problems. We solved the problems, and the deal has actually gotten better the last sure. two years since we started. But you're betting on the team. 
And there are a million things that can go wrong. You have supply chains, you have governments, you have, I mean, there's a lot that can go wrong. Sure. So we started off with equity. We started off with all equity. And then the plan was once we were closer to finishing, we would take on some type of debt. And that's what we're doing now. We're taking on some debt to finish. Part of that too is on the first plant, we ended up expanding it beyond our original plan. And so it cost more than our original plan. So the last chunk, the last six months of us building is going to be debt. The rest of it is patient capital, which interestingly enough is going to be right on time. So that that is the plan, but you're right. This This is not a... The debt is immediate cash flow, and you're one hundred percent right. There's a difference between investing in something that is producing income, producing cash flow day one. That is a completely different model. And it's I would generally say that that's a safer, lower risk model. And so that's the right model for some people. And some people want to be a part of something different. So it it really depends on your profile. and And obviously, there's there's a reason and a rationale to have a split between these different things. Um, I tend to have a higher risk threshold than most people, and either I'm brave, brave or crazy. But it's I like building things, and whenever you build things, there a lot of stuff can go wrong that you've got to fix, and it's very high stress. But to me, it's worth it. Yeah, man, that's that's awesome that you're able to do that. Like, I don't think I have the stomach to do that. That's that's very for me. It is too scary. So you're saying that you raise the funds and. If it delays by a little bit, you have enough money raised to make the payments to the bank. And uh, I'm assuming the you don't make any payments to investors till you the project comes online and makes money, right? It's delayed. Yeah, uh, the the uh, equity payments. gets paid when there's there's cash flow. The debt gets paid uh, when as soon as the debt is is in place. Like the debt fund we have now to finish up the last chunk. Instead of going to a bank, we're, we're giving that opportunity to our investors. I always like to find ways to make people money and not banks money if I can do it. And so it's that they get paid immediately. They have cash flow starting within 30 days and it's built into our equity model to have the ability to pay that while we're finishing up the project the last six, eight months. Okay, so you just raising more money to be able to service that. And then you guys are all just getting picking up a salary to watch the project and make it make sure it's done. Uh, the, so the, the people that we've hired have salaries. Uh, we, we, we're, we're the ones that put the deal together. So we have, we have carried interest. That's, that's where we make our, our win. It's, it's on the, we're, there's an alignment between the investors and what we do. We all are going to win in a massive way together as it wins. It's not, it's not a lopsided thing where if it falls apart, we won and nobody else won. It's, it's really when the thing works, we all win yeah. together. Yeah, I like that, man. That's cool. So, so you do you do other things too, man? Like to make cash flow for your family or you? Uh, well, I mean, really, this is I, I've gone all in. I mean, I've got millions of dollars of my own money in this, and all my time is in this. I moved next to it, and I think that that's one of the questions to ask anybody when you know when, when we're looking at investments. How all in are you on this thing? Is this one of seventy five things you're doing? Like, if this goes bad, how big of a deal is this? I am about nine and a half months pregnant on this. Like, there is, I'm all in. And so is my partner. And so is the whole team. And, and that just that goes to show you the level of commitment that we're going to solve any problem that comes up, no matter what it takes. It this is this is everything to us. It means everything. And we we're betting our entire lives and our fortunes on it. So I think that's an important thing and it's a valuable thing for people that are investing money. That's awesome, man. Uh um, that's really cool. We should uh we should uh, circle back next year to see where the I would be curious to know what the first project did, you know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. It's exciting. It'll be, it'll be producing uh, in, in November. We anticipate products going out and, and um, you know, that that's, it's just going to keep expanding from there. So uh, it's this, this is a big year. This is going to be a very exciting year. We actually just had the governor of Arizona bring us in for, uh, to acknowledge what we've been doing and had that meeting a couple of weeks ago. And, and there's, there's a lot of people paying attention to what we're doing because it is that disruptive. Yeah. 60 million and 3000 homes. What is that? How many, is that how many, 200,000 is it? Is that 200,000 per how home? Is it two, uh, 200? What was the question? Um, because you said 60 million will be the net profit. So you, you said you can build about 3,000 homes. So what is that? Yeah, it's about 3,000 homes. So that's how much you're bringing in per home in terms of profit then, you think? Right? So it, so part of the model depends on whether we're doing houses or apartments. It depends yeah, on what the market is. And so it's the overall, the mix and it between houses and apartments is it and we we depend 
it depends on the market environment. If you have really high interest rates, you tend to have less homes being built. You have more apartments being built with, with federal HUD money. And so we would naturally gravitate towards that when you have rates like we've had the last 10, 12 years where they were three, four or 5% for homes, there was a huge home boom. And so that's where, the, where most of the demand was. So we're, we're dynamic and we're, we're just going to go where it goes. But in the aggregate, when you think about the whole thing, uh, that's, that's what we expect when you have full capacity, and you, you have all the different revenue coming in. Um, that's that's what we expect the numbers to, to land at. And you're going to hold on to that for maybe a year and then sell it to a third party and then charge a franchise fee or something? Or I, it, It's possible. It's, it's, it's possible that we have somebody come in the day before we start and they say, okay, we see you're ready to go. We want to buy this before somebody else does. There's, there's a lot of interest. We've had multiple meetings already with multiple billion dollar public companies that have voiced interest. And I think that they're just waiting until we get close. Ultimately, we're going to have one plant that's available this year that's going to come online. And, and the builders around the country, anybody that's operating in Arizona is going to want to get in on it. And they're going to want to say, okay, we want this and we want the ones you're going to put in all of our locations. And we want to, we want to have exclusives on that because it's going to be beneficial to them. But the other problem is that if, it's, if their competitor gets it, then they're going to be competing against this. And I don't think builders really want to compete against this. This is way faster, way more efficient. It's going to make, it's going to make whoever owns it a lot of money. Yeah, man. Nice. Have you talked to, uh, you probably know, do you uh, uh, know Kenny McElroy too? Yeah. Yeah. I'm good friends with Kenny. Oh, nice. So is he uh, expressed interest to use your products? Uh, we, we have talked about, we have talked about frame tech. So, you know, there's that you never really know how these things are going to play out. A lot of times, People are just they're they're watching, and when it goes on online, then there's a lot of energy that's put into how do we implement, how do we use this? Uh, it's so yeah, there's something there could happen. I think it's it's very interesting because he's you know he's obviously in Arizona, so he's his a lot of his stuff is all over the country, but he does have stuff here, and it, his office is literally right in between the two plants. So it's it's sort of funny, but that's that's how it works. Yeah, he's he's uh, he's he's a very um, big uh, into uh, building ground up too. So yeah, he's got a management company. Yeah, so he might be a good uh, guy to chat with. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I love Kenny. Yeah, awesome man. Hey, thanks for coming on the podcast, and uh, I would love to catch up with you maybe next year. Good luck. You have a call now, right? Yeah, absolutely. We're we're actually about to about to talk about the the debt fund opportunity for people. So uh, all that information about what we're doing with the funds and and frame tech. If you want to follow along, check it out. Frametech.com. It's t e c dot com. And, and follow along. This is going to be a great, great adventure and a great story. To to it, it's really about building something and and building America. And that's that's our contribution to doing it. So we look forward to having everybody checking it out. And I appreciate you having me on here to share the story of what we're doing. Awesome, man. We'll put we'll put it on the uh, uh, show notes. Uh, just to be clear, is that only for uh, accredited investors? It is for accredited okay. investors. The debt fund has. Uh, it, the regulation it's under has 35 spots right now. So you, if you're not accredited, there is an opportunity, uh, a brief opportunity, but normally it's accredited only. Oh, okay. So you can do, okay. That's cool. All right. Yep. Thanks, Damien. All right. Thanks, Vince. Appreciate it. All right, man. Thank you. I don't know about you, but I definitely like to see five-star reviews on any service or any product before I purchase. Please take a second to leave us a five-star review, whether you're listening to it on Apple iTunes or Spotify or whatever platform. Take a second. It goes a long way. Helps us a lot to grow the channel. And thanks for listening.